Hi there, I'm Claire McDonald Liu, and this is the Family Health Lab. In today's conversation, I'm talking with Bitten Johnson, the leading international expert in food addiction. Bitten shares her own story of battling alcohol, nicotine, and sugar addictions, why food addiction is at the root of all other addictions, and the steps to take to heal the brain. You're listening to the Family Health Lab. Healthy parents. Hello, Bitten. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a real privilege to have you on. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be on with you this morning in Sweden. We have been in this space of food addiction specifically, very clearly in that space for over 30 something years and you have studied all around the world. Well, thank you. I'm happy to share with you. And, you know, when watching your website, I see that you uh, address children and families, and I'm very happy for that because uh, I decided a long time ago I'm going to work with adults, so I only work with people 18 and older, but of course they have family, they have children, so it's rings on the water for the families. And, you know, there's been some exciting things happening in families that has done a major change in eating and lifestyle and all that. So um, I came into addiction medicine um, by ending up in a treatment center in California in 1985 for my alcoholism. And I was devastated. I thought that was the end of the world. I was the worst, lowest, you know, most horrible person on earth. And they shocked me totally by telling me it was a brain illness. And I thought, as a nurse, I had no idea. In Sweden, it's like character flaw, uh, no willpower, you know, very shameful. So that's how I felt, trying to hide it and all that. But you can't hide addiction uh, for <laughs> too long. And then uh, I was uh, sober for seven years, uh, but I was studying addiction medicine. I loved it. I just said, oh, this is the new world. So I never went back to regular nursing. I started just learning everything I could about uh, addiction medicine. In US. And then uh, coming back to Sweden, it was like going to the dark ages, or as I call it, Stonehenge, when it comes to addiction. Uh, and I think it still is in many ways too sad to see. But um, I quit smoking after seven years because I wanted to be even healthier. And that's when uh, I realized that I was, you know, totally, totally addicted to chocolate and ice cream. I could not stop. And that shocked me. I mean, I could stop alcohol. I could stop nicotine. How in the whole world could I not stop chocolate and ice cream, which were my favorite? Not so much into pasta, bread, and all that. Never really liked that. Uh, So uh, I mentioned that to a colleague I work with from the U.S. She said, why don't you, maybe you're a food addict. And I looked at her like she was telling me about Martians or something. I never heard the terminology, food addict. This was in 92. But she said, we have training in Chicago in one of our units in uh, Trinity Lutheran General Hospital in Chicago. So I said, I got to go there. So I went there, and that's how it all started. Then the rest is history, as they say. But, you know, in the beginning, if I just look at the food, but I have to remind you that changing food is only about 10% of the whole recovery process when you're an addict. So people think it is all about what shall I eat? And then I'm fine. Well, I tell you what, it's not. Addiction is a disease that rewires your whole brain. And you get into addictive thinking, addictive feeling, addictive urges, addictive behavior. Because addiction affects the whole brain. You can't isolate it. So anyway, the food plans we had at that time uh, you know, were a constant daily fight. It was low fat, it was fruit, it was whole grain, lots of veggies, but we didn't know anything else. We had no knowledge about nutrition, which is shocking being a nurse. When I look back, what? Would you feed your brain and your body? No, no, no. We we have maybe one hour at school or something, and I think I think it is the same in doctors and nurses training today it's very little so anyway uh, I got more and more curious and it wasn't actually until 2005 I listened to this Swedish female doctor 
and I regard her highly. She was really gutsy. She was a GP, and she lived in a town eight miles, uh, well, uh, eight Swedish miles, but an hour north of me. And she started talking about low carb. And I had heard the word Atkins, but it was more like, don't ever do that. It's so dangerous and you die and blah, blah. So, but she talked about low carb, high fat. And I thought, wait a minute, what's this? I started looking at it and then it hit me so much because I knew that being a sugar addict, which I prefer to call it today because I like to talk about the psychoactive substance, meat and butter are not psychoactive substances. You know, looking at that food plan, I thought this must be much better when it comes to curb cravings to take away, you know, so many of the carbs, because if you're sugar sensitive, you're carb sensitive. So I thought, oh, yeah. So I jumped on the wagon right away and started studying that instead and learning more about that. And so many things made sense. And, you know, here it is. So fruit is the best thing to eat and veggies is the best thing to eat and blah, blah. And then there was one GP here and he said, yeah, yeah. To think that you get fat from, from good fats, it's as stupid as thinking you're going to get green from eating veggies. You know, I thought it was a fun thing. But uh, anyway, so I put all my clients on that food plan and it worked so much better, of course. So they were satiated. The brain was getting the nutrients that it was craving and had been starved of. And then it could stop. So those um, uh, neurotransmitters and that excitability in the brain, it could start helping to relieve that. Of course. And, you know, uh, people were afraid in the beginning to start eating like that because people are so fat scared that it is incredible. Yeah. But, you know, I keep pushing and I noticed that the craving went down. It wasn't gone because we're addicts, right? We can get cravings from anything. When I did that, you know, things started happening. But uh, quite soon, I realized that many people could not handle dairy. They could handle butter and ghee, but whipped cream and and, uh, sour cream and uh, cow cheese and stuff like that, they overate. And I wondered why that was. So I started to study more about casein the milk protein and the body's reaction to that, you know, especially the pancreas Mm -hmm. releasing insulin and creating what we call volatile blood sugar. And people could not stick to their food plan because they were very, very hooked into those dairy products. Mm -hmm. So uh, after a while, I sort of says that about 70% of the clients did have that sensitivity So we started to take that away. And of course, a lot of people don't like that. But, you know, again, we could see a betterment in health when they were taking that away. They could stick to the food plan and they could lose weight and they weren't so insulin swollen. So uh, that worked better. And the idea is, uh, you know, to and today we eat keto. And the thing we still had at that time nuts and seed crackers and you know the low carb stuff the replacements low carb replacement products and keto keto replacements yeah but not keto dessert we understood that was dangerous but mm-hmm. we did have the the seed crackers and the nuts okay. and uh, uh, 2016 i think it was i realized that i don't think this is doing anything good to my body and the interesting thing is that in 1998, in November, I had one of the first weekly training for clients. There was a a dietitian from Stockholm coming to that training. And, you know, dietitians hardly ever come to my training. They don't believe in this at all, at least not in Sweden. But anyway, she gave me a simple paper. You know, we didn't have computers or PowerPoint at that time. We had overhead. And copying. And the paper said from seed to oil. And it was really showing how you how the industry makes margarine and how they process like canola uh, oil and all that. So she said these are highly inflammatory. So I was talking about that. Today we have I saw you had Chris Narbon with Lisa. 
Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. I share that video a lot sure. uh, and talk about it. So I've talked about this through the years, but it was like talking to uh, deaf people. Peter, it sounds like you throughout your career have met some trailblazers um, and been in the right place at the right time because of your uh, eagerness to learn and your passion for this topic. But you, you really have um, been an early adopter. You mentioned low carb so early on and food addiction and mentioning now that the dietitians are still, still not keen and still push back in Sweden regarding food addiction and, and what you're doing. You've been in this space and meeting these people and learning, and you've really been a, a pioneer in so many of these different aspects. Do you, do you think things are getting better with regards to, well, I'm still calling it food addiction, but I do understand that distinction between sugar and food addiction. If you could clarify a little bit more about that, that would be great. But do you feel that the situation is getting better with our mass understanding of the, of the need for support for these people? Yes and no. Um, if 100 people uh, if I look at 100 people uh, you know 98 will not uh, listen and 2 will listen so of course there are a lot of people out there you know I browse through Instagram which I usually do in the morning to check out what's going on and you know you can see a lot of people that are there promoting good health and giving good scientific information but on the other hand, you see that diabetes is on the race. Obesity among children is on the race. Uh, screen addiction is on the race. And sugar is the gateway drug to all other drugs. Other drugs are on the race. So, uh, I, you know, I'm really torn answering you on that question because I think that people are still into keto diet losing weight. And that is a very that is not a good connection. If you if you treat keto as a diet, you know, diet is always start stop, mm-hmm. and you have this idea that one day you're going to be able to eat what you love again or what you're hooked on. Actually, mm-hmm. of course, it's never going to work. And I and and I also know that when it comes to addiction, which is a severe, confusing, complex brain illness. If you look at that, you know, relapse are progressive. So if you diet for a while and think that you're doing the right thing without understanding the 90% of the recovery activities you have to do, because there's a huge difference between being abstinent or drug-free from certain foods to being in recovery. I mean, it's like they said to me in AA in the beginning, oh, this is easy. All you have to do is change everything in your life. <laughs> and people are not prepared because you have to understand that I call the addictive part of our brain the red dog mm-hmm. and the healthy part the blue dog. Mm-hmm. Just to try to help my clients to see that the enemy is within inside their head. And they are not bad. It's not your fault. It's very important to tell the addict. You have developed an addiction because your sensitive brain met a psychoactive substance and sugar sweeteners flour uh, carbs in uh, any form uh, processed food ultra processed food they are a psychoactive substance so that's what you have to take away but that's what people don't want to take away they want to think they find an easier way to do this and if i only lose weight i'll be fine ha ha it's not going to work that way because then the red dogs say, oh, you've lost weight now. We can eat those things. One bite will trigger maybe five years of crazy eating again, and you gain maybe 30 kilos. You maybe lost 20. So that's the nature of addiction. So you really are saying that people are using the wrong approach. They're coming to these um, food interventions with a wrong philosophy. Um, right. So it needs to be a lifestyle approach. I've heard you talking about the red dog and blue dog live at the public health collaboration event in Bristol. Uh, and it really did stay with me because it's just a complete game changer. Because what you're saying is the red dog is always going to be part of you. It's always going to be with you. Um, and you're learning um, strategies that are unique to you um, and constantly putting those in place on a daily basis. So can can you talk to me more about the 10%, 90%? You said 
recovery is, I think you said recovery is um, 10% food, which a lot of people, and I think, you know, I would have thought more so, but, but what's the 90%? Is there any case study or, or story without names that you can kind of give me an example of um, how, how it can be effective, that 90% of those strategies? Absolutely. So 10% is food and biochemical repair, breath, sleep, physical activity, maybe some supplements to take over the detox, the healing phase, because you have to heal the brain because the brain has been faulty wired due to the psychoactive substance. And it takes a long time to create new neurons, new pathways, learning to live in this world where you are. Remember that exposure with sugar and flour is when you're a baby and a toddler and a teenager. So your brain is not developed at that point. And the prefrontal cortex, which is the most important part of your brain to be able to, you know, have a daily good living is not developed. So if you feed it the wrong fuel, you get the faulty wiring. In order to recover, to go on the wagon or, you know, be abstinent is easy. But then you have to, 40% of the whole treatment concept is relapse prevention. Mm -hmm. Think about it, early exposure, constant exposure. And people that don't understand, that don't believe in this, that will push you. I call them food pushers and saboteurs. (laughs) You know, you've been good for so long, now you can have this. And then you have to understand that our brain has something called cue-induced craving. We, it's a physical reaction to sight, smell, and sound of the drug food, which is everywhere. Yeah. So you have to develop a strategy <clears throat> where you don't trigger on that. So the relapse prevention is diving very deep into your personality and your daily living and your surrounding, understanding risk situations. Like, you know, say tomorrow that I have to go to a, work function where I know it's going to be loaded with drug foods and people will push me. Uh, You know, then I work together in my team, my group, my tribe, my pack, whatever you want to call them, you know, asking, uh, uh, if this was your problem, what would you do? And you develop strategies to handle the situations day after day, one day at a time, because that's all we can handle. So those are the risk situations. A wedding, Uh, you know, a birthday, uh, uh, vacation. There are many, many risk situations where you risk getting attacked by a red dog from inside because you have to remember how powerful sugar addiction is compared to other addictions. You would think that's a milder addiction. Uh Uh-uh, no, no, no. Uh, Because when the processed food hits our brain, our body, Something going to happen with the reptilian brain. In there, you have an instinct to eat, which says, not in words, but, you know, drives you. If you don't eat, you die. That's Mm -hmm. very powerful. Then you get an overactive reward uh, system, you know, neurotransmitters that go too high and too low, which sets you totally out of balance, which is going to scream for more. Then you have a pancreas that's going to start overproducing and being overacting in insulin, which is going to press all the glucose out in your cells, which is going to make your blood sugar drop, which is going to make your reptilian brain scream louder, which is going to make your uh, uh, neurotransmitters wanting their hit, which is going to make you eat something, which is going to make an overactive uh, pancreas. So you are in the middle of that fight with three big things going on all the time. So that's going to push you. So that's why we become obsessed. Uh, That's why we lose control. Uh, You know, that's why we feel ashamed because we shouldn't, but we do. So it's a vicious circle going on and on. The more uh, processed food we eat, the stronger this gets. This is not the case with alcohol. There is no instinct to eat with the alcohol. And it's not. It is uh, insulin increased, but not in the same way. So uh, that's why sugar addiction is the toughest addiction to deal with and the most shameful because, you know, well, 
you could think if I lose control over cocaine, yeah, that's more known. But sugar, sharp up, you know. So that's why, and you understand that that that's you have you have to rewire your brain. But also, knowing if, if anything that is a connection in your brain, a thought or a feeling or an urge or anything, will never go away. That memory is always there. So you have to do uh, rewiring. I call that brain bypass. <laughs> you have to do a new <laughs> neuron. And you know, when you're learning something new, it takes time to get that to be natural. So you're, you're rewiring after decades and decades and decades of um, programming. Yeah, it takes at least two years from the day you go drug-free to heal your brain, balance mm-hmm. in all those reptilian brain calming down. So a lot of the treatment we do with addicts is calming the reptilian brain, calming the pancreas, calming the neurotransmitters so they get down to some kind of balance level. So you're not triggered as much. We help clients to uh, go deep and map out their warning signs. What's my warning sign? One of my worst warning signs is being tired. It sounds silly, right? But when I'm tired, my red dog wakes up and thinks, oh, should we treat this? Maybe you should have some chocolate. (laughs) And then I have to, you know, handle that situation or angry or Uh, feeling moody or whatever, feeling guilty because I'm not doing what I should do or whatever, whatever. So each client has their own pattern. So you help them look at the patterns and you see, okay, you have a strategy here, you need a strategy here. And then 50%, the rest of the 50% is support. Because when you're going to do this big transformation in this world that is pushing you to eat, saying that you are the crazy one, you need people that understand addicted minds in order to help you to not act on triggers. So the group support is important. But I, I want to mention one thing that I think is very important. What professionals and everyone working with this needs to understand is that we do have people that are not addicted at all. They have a totally healthy, normal relationship with food. We don't have to work on them. They usually eat very well. Then we have a big group that have a harmful use and that they eat because they're stressed or unhappy or feelings or um, they have no knowledge. It's in their culture. There are many reasons. They are not addicts, but they do develop negative consequences. And they can learn to eat in moderation if you help them understand why and how they are eating the wrong foods that create unhealthiness in their body. Then we have the addicts. Uh, So you need to know the difference because with addicts, you can never go in moderation. Mm -hmm. That's going to trigger them constantly to go back to their sick patterns and be sicker and sicker. And that's why I developed, you know, the diagnostic tool, sugar. So more people, more professionals should actually use that and see, oh, this is harmful use. Good. I can work this now. Oh, this is addiction. Ooh, this is serious. This is a brain illness. Now I have to work in another way. That's what's lacking in the world to understand that. So there is a clear distinction. We do have different groups who are, who may their behaviours may look from the outside. Um, if you don't go through a diagnostic process like the one that you've created, sugar, that it may look you know a blurred line between who has addiction and who doesn't. But um, the more people that go through that process, and the more professionals that train, and I believe you train professionals in being able to apply that, the more we can access. Um, reach out and give people the most appropriate support um, and what uh, what I was wondering is who um, who comes for treatment do people recognize this and and then get access themselves or, or what is the pathway to this kind of support well somebody asked us we used to say that we are the last house on the street sugar addiction professionals because people try everything and And remember, people are very resilient. I admire their battle, trying every method, even doing surgery on a healthy stomach or, uh, you know, uh, 
doing lots of weird things, lots of starving and you name it. Uh, so they're very resilient. They think that they are losers and bad and have no willpower. It's the opposite. They're very strong people. They get up again, try something new. But, you know, they try the wrong toolbox all the time. So people that come to us, they know deep inside that they have the loss of control. And they have thought many times, what if I'm an addict? What if I'm an addict? Maybe I'm an addict. I don't want to be an addict because it has such a bad reputation, which is stupid. It's a brain illness. We should yeah. talk addiction more and help yeah. people see. Here are the signs. So anyway, when they come and we do the diagnostic and they, we tell them, okay, the result is that you have developed an addiction. And they start crying, not because they are sad or angry. They are relieved. They go, like, oh, so that's what it is. Uh-huh. And we tell them it's not your fault. And we explain the brain, the brain mm-hmm. illness, and we talk about all the aspects of this. And they cry and say, first of all, when we ask them the questions in the diagnostic, they say, nobody ever asked me these questions. They only ask me, do you exercise enough? Do you eat too much? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they don't ask the specific addiction questions. And people go, it was very interesting to answer these questions. So the relief is there. Of course, mm-hmm. occasionally there is somebody that wants to do it to prove they're not. But 99 mm-hmm. times out of 100, they are. They don't want to be an addict, but so they wouldn't prove it. But And they might be very pissed and they go off. And it takes a few years when they're getting much sicker before they come back. That happens. But most people are very relieved. And then we tell them, you know, about the brain and how this works and why they do what they do and why they feel how they feel. Because you have to remember that this illness affects every aspect of your life. You get physical, psychological, social, and spiritual consequences, which, you know, I answered one thing on Twitter yesterday. Somebody said, you know, uh, uh, do I eat because of my negative emotions? I said, no. The drug has caused negative emotions, and that's why you keep eating, you know. So we have to learn to put the horse in front of the wagon. But if you don't understand addiction, you're going to think you eat because you're depressed, because you have pain in your back, because you don't have a job, or you don't like your job, or blah, 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 blah. Uh, It's the opposite. The drug creates havoc in your brain long before you notice the consequences. So when we do the diagnostic, we see that people's first symptoms of sugar addiction is between three and five years of age. That's interesting. It is interesting. So I would like to come to that because you mentioned children earlier. Um, So can we see that in children now? I know you don't work you are only with adults. Yeah. First of all, you see what they choose to eat. Uh, many parents have told me when I treated their young adult ones that uh, I'm not surprised that she or he is a food addict or sugar addict because when she was little or he, she or he only wanted white foods. Mm. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, white foods, soft white foods, bread, mm. pasta, uh, puddings, you know, that type of thing. They didn't like the meat and potato stuff. And also uh, moodiness is one thing. <clears throat> the child get temper tantrums or moodiness and, and you know, sleep disturbances. Um, even bed wetting could be connected to this because the brain is so out of balance. And then they always try to lie, hide, and sneak to get it. To ask that, because that's the kind of behaviors that I've um, read about sugar addiction, behaviors that lying, that kind of can't can't resist, taking more than you intended to, hiding it, hiding wrappers in. So, so with a child, um, say a, a parent is, is thinking about this could be a possibility. That, 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 so it would be a child is particularly tuned into the beige white foods, craving those um not eating as the family are eating. You might find empty wrappers and lying about what they've had or finding money to go to the shop and get soft drinks. I have one uh, excellent uh, 
student in my training, she's a group expert now. She's absolutely wonderful to look and listen to. She thought that her problem started when she was 10, 11, when I talked to her the first time. And then with knowledge, she remembers stealing the baby aspirins, you know, sweet flavored baby aspirin. Oh she God. climbed up the cupboard and took those. So she had to go to the hospital. Oh my and God. then... Uh, she underst- She saw that her pattern was when she was three. It started when she was three. And the next thing she did, she stole her brother's antibiotics, liquid, sweet, pink. <laughs> and she drank it all and got sick again. Uh, you know, so the more knowledge you get, the more you can look back and see, oh, my gosh, the signs were very early. We, yeah, and if the professionals currently, the majority, the vast majority of mainstream professionals don't understand this, they don't understand the warning signs and they don't understand the diagnostic tools that are available to them, then how is the, the layperson supposed to uh, understand? But say, say we do recognize that a, a loved one uh, has uh, really clear signs of addiction. What, what, what would we do? What could we do for a loved one, whether they are they're positive about getting help or whether they're in denial what what would you say that the steps that you've seen have been effective you have to remember that there are several uh, states of denial the hardest one that you see in addicts is that they have a biochemical imbalance remember what i thought you about you know the three enemies in there fighting pushing you uh, so they don't connect things they have fragmentary thinking they don't think well my moodiness is not because I ate sugar last night. My anger is not because of this. They don't want to see the connection. So one of the things I work a lot with is connecting the dots, hashtag connect the dots, helping people see to get you know things in perspective. But this is because of this. And to put the horse in front of the wagon, which is very important. But my advice uh, to save some brain and body and not uh, let this linger for too long is to do what I call a care confrontation. Let's assume that you were my sister because, you know, and you are slim, so it has nothing to do with weight. I have anorectics that are very, very sick sugar addicts, normal weight and overweight. Mm -hmm. So it is probably in the brain, not in the weight. Okay, that's good to point out too. I would Mm -hmm. say to you, Claire, uh, I'm very concerned about your health and I'm concerned about the way you're eating and I noticed you lie to me and you hide things and I see your moodiness, I see you being so tired all the time and grumpy and, you know, that I would point that out. And you might want to hit me because it's none of your business and you shouldn't, because the red dog is going to defend the drug with anger. Or mopiness. You quit talking to me. You give me the silent treatment. So those are some of the reactions. But, you know, what we do is we help families to do this type of care frontation, not a confrontation, a care frontation, and also stop enabling. If you have somebody, you know, that all the money goes to sweets, buy them food, don't give them money. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there are many things you can do. So we have strategies for that, of course, to help people, uh, you know. uh, But, you know, sometimes you have uh, a 25-year-old that gets so mad at their parents that they move to the other side of the world. And then you have to let go. You have to see that you did everything you could. But, you know, this is a very, very dangerous, deadly disease. So people will get sicker and die. So you can't save everybody. No, and I think that is a point that I'm not sure if uh, when we talk about food addiction that comes across, sugar addiction, food addiction, I think that um, how dangerous this is. You know, you're saying clearly that it's deadly. It is very deadly because, you know, you have to think about that it affects the whole body. You get the metabolic dysfunction. <clears throat> you get the imbalance in neurotransmitters. Your microbiome breaks down, so you get inflammations. I mean, I could go on and on and stack all the negative consequences that's going to come with this. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. also that you are actually trapped in your illness. 
And, you know, most people think that they are bad, so they have to try to fix it themselves. So one thing is very important to see that this is a problem. You you are a very loving, healthy, beautiful blue dog, but you do have a red dog that's going to kill you if we don't get handle on it. So it's a lot of dog training, <laughs> you know, to calm down the red dog and uh, actually not act on it. Like if my red dog would say to me one day, he'd say, you know, You've been so good now. Maybe we should have some chocolate. And I, <clears throat> before I panic because, you know, I see this big battle in front of me. Oh, I'm going to do this. And today I just smile and lean back and said, oh, are you visiting today? Well, you know, I don't have time to play with you today. So why don't you come back another day? <laughs> I deflate it, so to speak. And uh, also that... Recovery is one day at a time. To make a commitment in the morning, uh, no matter what happens today, I'm not going to eat shit, as I call it, or drug food or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm going to stick to my food plan uh, and have a good day. And I'm not obsessed about food. Uh, You know, food is fuel and medicine for me, and that's how I use it. So I go and fill up like a car in the gas station and say, oh, I'm going to have lunch so, so I can work the afternoon. And then I have dinner and wah, wah. Um, but, you know, it doesn't. And then I do other good things, fun things, good things. I work, I play between. my The meals are not ruling me. That's an interesting thing. When I stopped uh, eating sugar and some junky foods and I didn't realize that I ate very much at all, but we went really strict on our keto diet family for um, our daughter's health. And um, then the chatter had disappeared. I noticed that I was talking to somebody like yourself, having a conversation, and I wasn't looking around at, you know, the food behind that was appearing. I wasn't um, thinking about, you know, what time the shop is closing so that, you know, we could, yeah. you know I could get there in time. Exactly. But, and that chatter I hadn't been aware of at all. It wasn't yeah. until that all oh. calmed beautifully. Yeah. But I, that I really realised because it had been a constant part of my life. I spoke to Dr. Jane Unwin, I, I believe you, you know her very well and her husband Dom as well. Um, and we, we had that discussion that, you know, that chat has been going on for, for her and not realising why she kept going back to those foods uh, over time, not realising because, because, you know, even working in the addiction space and working in, in psychology, she hadn't realised that food addiction was a thing and it could be affecting her, which is which is um, amazing how much we've got to learn about everything. You mentioned your, your food and having to keep on track of your red dog on a daily basis, even decades later. What What, what is a typical um, day of food looking like? What kind of meals? And I know that everybody will be totally different, but... I might, might be interested in walking through your, your typical food. Absolutely. I eat like a more ketovore, uh, keto carnivore uh, diet today. Uh, I love meat and butter, <laughs> any meat. <laughs> but um, I do the bulletproof in the morning, you know, because uh, I keep uh, a bit of coffee in the morning because I love coffee, the smell. Growing up in Sweden, coffee is like, if you don't drink co- coffee, you're a nerd and should be living out in space or something. And I never like tea. My stomach gets upset with tea. So I have a cup of coffee and I have both ghee, coconut oil, and an egg yolk in that. Uh, and I do that in a mixer. And I drink my bulletproof. And, you know, I'm totally 100% satisfied not even thinking about food. You know, at lunch, I usually have, like I could take yesterday, I had minced lamb, which are mixed with feta cheese and lots of good spices and some egg to bind it. And I mixed that whole, uh, you know, stuff. And then I made beef from it. And I spice it with garlic and chili and, and other good stuff and salt, of course. So I had only that. And I had the same for dinner. I don't mind eating the same for lunch and dinner. Because I always cook a lot, so I don't have to cook all the time because that's boring to cook. Uh, And then I eat cod. I love cod uh, with shrimps and and butter and, you know, all kinds of meat and bacon and pork belly is one of my favorites. And the veggies I eat usually is like cauliflower 
Uh, I can eat broccoli, green peas. Uh, you know, usually I have some warm veggies with it when I do. Not a lot, but, you know, I enjoy some veggies, so I do that. And sometimes no veggies. Uh, and, you know, my body loves this because my energy level is this, stable. And I mm-hmm. wanted to point out, you said, when you talk, we talked about, you know, symptoms, you know, the obsession that we have, the chatter, as you call it, which is a good yeah. word. That is incredible draining on your mitochondria, on your energy level. So it leaves you wired and tired. I just wanted to point that out so people can, you know, relate to that. Uh, but that's how I eat. So I usually eat lunch around 12, 1, and I have dinner with at 5, 6. Sometimes if, I'm, if I work to 7, I can eat dinner after, before or after. Um, so that's, you know, uh, my food. I take some magnesium when I go to bed. Uh, uh, I can take uh, D vitamin in the winter. I go to the tanning booth because, you know, UV light is very important here in Sweden. And it's not like in the old days when we were young, we went an hour every day and destroyed our skin. So maybe 15 minutes once a week. I use a red light therapy lamp in the winter. Uh, but I am an outdoors person. But like yesterday, we had minus 24 centigrees. Ooh. And I have a tiny chihuahua. She weighs two kilo. We don't take okay. long walks in that weather. But if the temperature is minus up to eight or something, we go for between six and nine kilometers every day mm-hmm. in the woods, you know, with family and friends. Uh, my sister has a dog and we usually walk a lot together. Uh, in the summer, I'm outside all the time to get sun, sun, sun. Uh, I take salt shot sometimes in the morning and sometimes in the afternoon, unrefined sea salt, big teaspoon, big glass of water in the afternoon. And after 15 minutes, I'm fit for fight again if I'm a little bit low or tired. We all have to find... Uh, what suits my body, my mind, my soul, you know, uh, I I could never live in a city. I would go bonkers after three hours. Mm-hmm. So I'm a nature person. I grew up like this and I, I love the lake and, uh, you know, growing my roses and doing all that kind of stuff. So people ask me all these things and sure, I share. But I have to remind everybody, you have to find your way. But. As long as you're, you have foggy brain and you have a big red dog that is running your life, you can't find your own way. So you have to detox. And I think most people can never detox themselves. If you spend all this money on all these methods and all this junk food and everything, please invest in a professional counselor. You find them on my website. I mean, people go to the doctor if they... Uh, bounce a toe, you know, mm-hmm. but this huge dangerous problem that's ruining their whole body is like, I have to fix it myself. I said, No, yeah. you can't. That's an illusion. Don't yeah. do that. And they've been trying to for years, trying, failing, trying to make, and, and continue. And I would, I don't know, you're in this space, but uh, I work with clients, as you, you mentioned earlier, I work with families. But I do see food addiction cropping up, and it's within my friendship circle. It's within my family as well. Um, the care invention, I, I really like that approach, but also learning when to back off as well because you can't fix everybody. But, yeah, I really do feel that there's a lack of willingness to get that professional support for certain health topics. People will go out and have a massage or a haircut or go and see the conventional doctor. Or vacation not- in another country. <laughs> Exactly, but not necessarily come in uh, to this. So if somebody was at that stage with or without their family support and they wanted to seek out one of the counsellors, the therapists that have been trained in your system can can go through the diagnostics, but also that deep um, personal and then group support. Um, do, do they operate online or is it in person? And what countries are they working in at the moment? Well, we have them spread all over. Most are in US and Canada, but they're all mm-hmm. online. We have some in Sweden. Uh, not mm-hmm. everyone here works in English. But, you know, you can find 
Um, and I always invite people to email me and tell mm-hmm. me where do you live, and I'm going to find one that is sort of within your time zone because mm-hmm. that can be a trick, you know, um, yeah. uh, to not be on the same like if you're in Europe or US or Canada or what have you. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But you know, people work online with clients. They work. Uh, one-on-one, which I don't advise anyone to do because working in group with addicts is the most important thing for healing because you have to do the identification process. You have to listen to others because Red Dog is very loud, very chattery. You have a lot of biochemical denial because your biochemistry is screwed up. Um, And most of all, you have stigma, denial, and shame together in a black hole that prevents you from really stepping out and talking. So you need to sit in a group and listen to others and think, oh, my God, I've done that too. Oh, I did that too. I did that too. And hearing that, because everybody thinks they're alone. Nobody has done so so much stupid things than I have. This is what people tell me when they come to my group. And another thing that I love that's interesting is that when they come to my intensive live training which I don't do anymore because I only train professionals now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Jen Nguyen does live training. So if you're mm-hmm. in UK, you're happy. Uh, mm-hmm. So anyway, you know, I ask them first day, why are you here? And they look at me embarrassed and say, well, you know, I do have a problem with food. And then they say, laughing a little bit embarrassed. Well, I have lots of problems actually, but I'm here for the food. And I think, oh, boy, you're in for shock. (laughs) And then, you know, we go through the training, which is very intense and all that. And I ask them at the last hours, what has made the most impact on you? And they look at me and with big eyes and they say, you know what? I realized I have one problem, but many consequences. And that makes it so much easier to handle. And people also say to me, oh, I want to tell you my whole life story. And I go, please don't, please, I don't want to hear a word of your life story. And they think it's the trauma or it, they think it's this and that causing it. And I said, it's not. All I want to know about it is your red dog. What is your red dog saying to you? What is your red dog doing to you? I only want to know about your addiction. Then I can help you. I don't need to know all the consequences. So that's a really interesting point. And you you said it earlier and you've said it many times, but it's just worth getting that point across. That people want to talk about the trauma, they want to talk about the behaviors, they want to look the, the divorce or the poor relationships with their parents or siblings or whatever, um, or their boss that's kind of driving them nuts. But you want to get back to the fact that this is a brain illness, they have a particular genetic predisposition, a set sensitive brain. And this is leading to these traumas, these problems, these difficulties and not being able to handle and manage them and then being in uh, these addictive outlets. Food always first. The food always comes first. And then food is the gateway drug. The processed food starts the path in your brain. So you become more easily nicotine addicted if you try nicotine or screens or alcohol or drugs. And a lot of people go that way. And so we actually work with something called addiction interaction disorder, one illness, many outlets. And, but you know, we don't treat the food or the alcohol or the pills. We treat the brain. We go straight for healing the brain so that all these things calm down. We take away all the drugs. That's very important to do. Uh, And that's the way it looks for people, you know. Uh, and and also the fragmentary thinking that they don't see how all this is connected. And we've I've interchanged the terms food addiction and sugar addiction. And I think I think I hear that being used interchangeably out there. But a couple of points on that we we said we'd come back to that point to clarify what because I've heard you say you like cod as you just mentioned that you like eating meat but you're not addicted to eating cod. So there is a distinction between, I mean, you're you're saying food addiction is actually sugar addiction, really. Yeah, you have to understand the addictive, uh, and thank goodness I'm trained in alcoholism, pill and drug addiction, because it's the same thing. So I understand the addiction medicine and the addicted brain. So to me, 
for somebody to be addicted, it has to be a specific process or a psychoactive substance. Okay, so sugar, flour, processed, ultra-processed food are psychoactive substances. That's what creates your addiction. Once you're addicted, you know, the crazy behavior, which are called process addictions, the dieting, the starving, the binging, the purging, the volume eating, in the end, you get very overweight and very, very metabolically unhealthy. But they are, those behaviors are a way of trying to control the insane cry, craving to, you know, stop eating. You hear professionals say, don't restrict because then you binge. And I think, oh, my God, study addiction medicine because... A red dog that is untreated and doesn't understand they have an addiction. If you take away chocolate and think, oh, I'm going to lose weight. Three weeks later, the craving comes back because you have no other tools in your toolbox. Learning about behavior and all that. So, of course, you eat the chocolate and then you eat worse than ever because it's a progressive illness. Relapse is progressive. It gets worse. Uh, But you need help to find that food plan. So, Actually, the correct terminology in my nursing addiction medicine world is sugar flour addiction. Sugar flour. Uh, mm-hmm. But then once that is in place and you develop these, you know, once the reptilian brain, the neuro, the uh, rewards uh, system, uh, and your pancreas, when they're all operating on high gear, you overeat anything because you're the addiction drives you to do all kinds of crazy things. So people say, I can overeat meat too. Yeah, you can because you haven't, you know, got the treatment to calm down the brain. But, you know, uh, natural foods doesn't have a psychoactive propriety. Do you understand what I mean then? But you can binge, you can starve, you can, you know, do purge, you can overeat, which then people think is an eating disorder. In my world, it is a process addiction caused by the sugar addiction because your brain is screwed up. (laughs) So you try everything. You try to control it by starving. You lose uh, control. You overeat. You try to lose weight, get rid of it. You purge or exercise like a crazy maniac day and night. And then when you do that for several years, one day your body's homeostasis is shot. And you just sit down and eat and eat and eat to numb everything, and you get very overweight. So that's the process. Yeah. And you develop, you try nicotine, you try pills, you try cannabis, you try alcohol, and of course, you get 10 times worse. And I did hear you say about relapse that um, somebody who has come uh, away and managed their addiction, they're much more likely to relapse. Yeah, any any outlet in addiction where alcohol or whatever, we're all it's a recurrent illness, like any other chronic illness compared to multiple sclerosis, you can go into a flare up and you can be in remission. So that's mm-hmm. why we constantly we teach people to work on relapse prevention every day. You know, mm-hmm. keep that red dog calm. <laughs> and if something happens, know how to deal with it put a choke collar on it or whatever, call somebody and talk about it. Yes, it, because it's a chronic illness. That's why mm-hmm. you can't cure it. Yes. Once addiction yes. is developed, it's going to be there forever. So you have to learn how to deal with it. But, you know, any other chronic illness is the same. So learn about it. And people are more likely to relapse. So say somebody uh, has their uh, addiction with alcohol, but if they're a smoker or eating junk food, and and that's, um, they were 85%, I think, more likely to relapse in studies. And I think that's really clear in what you're saying, but I don't think that's very clear, again, in addiction circles, that they, that's such a big overlap between, between all of those um, outlets. People that work with alcohol and drug addiction, highly skilled addiction specialists, they don't they don't acknowledge sugar addiction. Uh, right. And I think it is an old thing, uh, you know, coming from the addiction field that we've been so good. I quit cocaine. I quit alcohol. I quit nicotine. At least I can have enjoy some sugar. 
But, you know, mm-hmm. they get diabetes type 2, they're overweight, they have inflammation, they're very unhealthy. But it's like they they, they don't want to listen to that part. So it is not. And, and then you have to think, do you know who Patrick Holford in UK is? No. Yeah, he has a site called Food for the Brain. I followed him mm-hmm. for years. Uh, I think it was 2009. He uh, looked at this, and it was, I think, 62 million people in UK at that time, or if it was 69, I don't remember exactly. But, you know, of those, there were 20 million sugar addicts, and then even less uh, alcohol, uh, nicotine addicts, and even less alcoholics, and even less opioid addicts. So compared, I don't remember exactly, but let's say there were 20 million sugar addicts, but only 500 heroin addicts. But, you know, we deal with heroin addicts. We don't want to see the sugar addicts. There are too many everywhere. So it's too prevalent. And then they're going for the highest, what's seen as the highest harm, but they're ignoring the, the huge, huge problem that, that you, you feel precedes all of the other problems anyway. Uh, any addict I see, I think it is sugar in the bottom. Yeah, so... It's hard to say, too, how many of each kind, because, you know, how do you split them up? An addict is an addict is an addict. Yes. Yeah, so so what is your feel on the prevalence in, in society? Like, how how many others um, do you feel? Of oh, everybody that's sugar addict? Mm. Oh, uh, <laughs> it's such a, <laughs> it's a huge number. I would say, um, it's hard to say, but I would say, what if 60% are addicts and... 20% are harmful users in today's society with this food. It's just a guess. You know, I have no evidence for all this because nobody's done a study about it. Uh, I've done some screenings on groups, and this is what I see. Uh, and, uh, you know, then there is this little group that has a normal eating behavior mm, or healthy yeah. or, yeah. Yes, the minority. <laughs> <laughs> the aliens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, um, to wrap up, I just wondered what you would really love um, people to know about this. You know, it's um, you're you've been pushing this pioneering this information and learning and researching and training people and and supporting people, counselling people. But um, you, the word is, is getting out and more professionals know about it. But, but it, I mean, I'm thinking from a family's perspective, what, what would you like people to know about this topic? Don't be ashamed. It's not your fault. This is, uh, the, uh, this is processed food's fault, if anything. And we don't start out eating that to develop illnesses. It's because it's in our culture and everything. So ask for help. Knowledge is power. Uh, but if it is shared, join up with others that discuss these questions, seek help, learn more, talk about it. You know, that's what I would like for people to do. And of course, I hope that people will read my book once it comes out in English, Sugar Bomb in Your Brain. Uh, you know, hopefully during the spring. I don't know. I don't want an exact deadline because it freaks me out. <laughs> <laughs> I can't uh, wait for that. Uh, it be exciting. Yeah, and they can go to my website and learn more. And also you have professionals on my website. So people can go to your website and I'm going to put a link in and, and they can follow you as well on social media. Is that is that the best way to kind of keep it in touch with you and keep and see what you're putting out there and finding out when you're coming out? Yeah, LinkedIn is the best. I do most job there, not so much on Facebook, but also uh, once in a while Instagram and Twitter. And when your book comes out in the spring, <laughs> I hope, <laughs> then, um, then, then I, you know, I can update this as well and, and pop that sure. link in. And uh, I'll be sharing that on LinkedIn because I want the world to know more about this. I see, I see the damage that this is doing and the difficulty people have in accepting it and seeking help. So, so I, I really thank you for, for your work here. So, uh, and, and really love to talk to you. So thank you, Bitten. Thank you very much for having me and spreading the word about this. It's going to help a lot of people. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please make sure to subscribe. This really helps us to be able to create more content.